Warm welcome. Thank you very much. The stage is all yours. All right. Hey there. Howdy, everybody. Um, I don't know how the hell I'm going to follow those other speakers. They were absolutely fabulous. What an incredible, incredible show. Let's hear it for, I mean, I'm going to talk about a little bit of history. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be tough following those guys. But uh, I'm going to talk about a group that I started when I was 18 uh, called the Billboard, Billboard Liberation Front, which was basically a prank from the beginning. There were many different aspects of the group that ended up being pranks that we didn't even know that we were uh, initiating at the time. Um, this, uh, this group started... Uh, it started uh, uh, from a group, another group called the San Francisco Suicide Club, which is a pranks, a pranks and a, a, a underground exploration and a weird events group. And this was the first billboard that was ever done. We snuck up on the roof of a building down, actually about a block from here, uh, right at Otis, uh, the uh, building right behind the uh, uh, hardware store there. And there's a billboard up on top of that, uh, on top of that uh, warehouse. And we changed the, you know, the caption, and there were 26 people, which is really stupid. You don't want to do this kind of thing with 26 people because there's really too many. And uh, we voted on what to change the caption to, and it took about three hours, and it was really an annoying process. There are actually two billboards. The other one on the flip side uh, had a much more boring uh, caption, but this is the one that I particularly like. So I, I was really turned on by this whole idea that you could literally go up onto a billboard. I was mean, 18 years old. I was a juvenile delinquent, and I'm like, my, you know, my God, you can just say whatever you want on a billboard. That's... A pretty awesome thing. So I got together with a guy named Irving Glick. His actual, his real name was David T. Warren. He passed away some years ago. But he used the name Irving Glick for uh, doing stuff that he wasn't supposed to do. And I thought, what a great idea. You can just have a fake name. So I came up with a name for myself for doing billboards, Jack Napier. And we did uh, start a thing called the Billboard, Billboard Liberation Front. And uh, this was an idea that Mr. Glick came up with. It was the first billboard that we did. And um, it uh, was the first, you know, cigarette uh, company. I, and, and, and the caption was, I'm realistic. I only smoke facts. And it was your, you know, your conservative-looking uncle who should know better. Uh, we had an arrow to the Surgeon General's warning. And uh, the thing that happened around this time that was very interesting to me is uh, our third partner in starting this group was a fellow named Simon Wagstaff. And uh, he's, uh, he was an unemployed gazebo painter. And he was... <laughs> He was, uh, and still is to this day, a fairly well-known local minor politician, and he completely disavows having any involvement in any of this stuff at all. He does a charity event that's really well-known around here. I'm not going to say which one. But uh, Simon, uh, he was a journalist at the time, and he had this great idea. He said, let's do a press release, right? And so I didn't know what a press release was, and he explained it to me, and we uh, did the, these billboards. We did six of them around town. We got chased off of one. Oh, I have to digress for a moment here. We got chased off of one of the billboards, the last one that we did. Uh, we were spotted by the police, and they had, couldn't get up on the building that we were on, so they had to call the fire department. By the fire department, by the time the fire department was going up on the, uh, on the billboard, we had already gone down the backside of the building and, and run away, and were hiding in a bar. Um, and I'd like to point out, this fellow right here, That is Irving Glick, and he was uh, one of my mentors, heroes, and one of the funniest pranksters I've ever known. When I was uh, 19 years old, taking off on a hitchhiking trip around the country, he gave me a giant rubber thumb and said, here, kid, you're going to need this. It'll help you out. <laughs> anyway, he was a really great guy. Um, and so while we were up on the billboard trying to figure out how we we're going to get away with the police down on the ground surrounding the, uh, the building, um, all of a sudden the police took off in a big huff. You know, they just raced away in their cars, and that gave us a moment to escape from the building on the backside of the building on a ladder. turns out that someone, w we don't know who, called in to the police department and said that there was a police officer being beaten up by people about six blocks away. <laughs> don't know who did that. Um, so the Billboard Liberation Front started, and, uh, you know, <laughs> this was uh, in, in response to, uh, in response to a, a, uh, an, an unfortunate incident in Alaska where Exxon had a big tanker that broke open and you know, dumped a, dumped, a bunch of, dumped a bunch of oil, which was a minor incident. And uh, also oil seepage is a natural occurrence as noted by an Exxon spokesman around that time. So we wanted to help them out. And by this time, see, we started as a terrorist organization. We, we named ourselves the Billboard Liberation Front. And the whole idea was that we were styling ourselves after the PLO or something like that. And we're really badass. And that uh, we actually had a member, Walid Rashid, who was supposedly ditched out of the PLO to join the Billboard Liberation Front because the PLO was pretty wimpy at the time. Later, as we got older, what happens, you know, you start out, you're young and idealistic and you're a revolutionary. Later, you know, you become older and more conservative. So we eventually morphed into being an advertising agency after starting as a terrorist group. Um, <laughs> and in between, there were some, <laughs> there, there were some educational uh, uh, billboards that we did. Now, the Billboard Liberation Front was an open group to people that we knew, and anybody. there were a lot of people. Actually, one of the things we told the media, which is really interesting, because the media can't turn down a spectacle or something that's funny or violent or, you know, 
prurient. So we would tell uh, Simon, Simon Wagstaff, who was the guy who came up with the idea for the press releases, and we would hand deliver them after we did a billboard, he would say things, he was our first press agent, he would say things like, well, when he's talking to the press, he'd say, well, there are 300 members of the Billboard Liberation Front, you know, we're operating in seven different cities around the state, and, uh, and we're mostly uh, advertising executives trying to expiate our guilt. And they would print this shit, okay, in the, in the newspapers. So uh, we'd go on, <laughs> this one I have, to, I, have to, I have to mention, this was the idea that a 19-year-old philosophy major at Reed College came up with. And he said, he said I, I, I'm studying Kantian philosophy and I just can't, can't get this out of my head. And it's like this whole, whole thing about autonomy and you know, the, 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 you know, the idea that people should be in charge of their own destiny and you know, this Kantian view of the world. And it's like, I just feel that you know, we should have a counter to that. And, uh, I, and, I, and I saw this Kent billboard, it should say Kant, and the choice is heteronomy. I'm like, that's great, what is heteronomy? And, <laughs> It was the opposite of autonomy, of course. We did a press release, sent it out. And, of course, this billboard was up. Most of our billboards were taken down like, uh, like this one was taken down within six hours, but we had photographs, and it was in newspapers all over the place. This one was up for two and a half months because nobody knew what the fuck it meant. <laughs> it, it was up so long... It was up so long that the th we did a pretty good job on it because one of the things we like to do is match the lettering font and do a good job and pasteovers. That the, it was kind of flapping in the wind. I had to go to back and I had to go back to repair it twice. <laughs> and two philosophy professors probably crashed their car when they saw it, and no one else noticed it. Simple, simple messages are always the best. This is another one, I can't take credit for this idea. A friend of mine, John Gilmore, who is a, who is a, her a heroic fellow, he started the Electronic Frontier Foundation with John Perry Barlow, recently deceased. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful fellows. And John was driving back and forth on the 101 and he kept seeing this billboard and he called me and goes, dude, I keep seeing this billboard and there's too many letters on it. <laughs> and he was right. Oh, all right, so I went out there with my girlfriend, um, um, uh, L.L. Fauntleroy, um, Vanessa, and uh, we just turned the letters off. There's switches on top of the letters. You turn them off. But we forgot to bring a camera. So we went back home, and then the, the sign company came out, turned them back on, so it said Hillsdale. And then we had to go back two weeks later, turn back off again to get a photograph. <laughs> this is the only billboard I know of in history hack that was ever done using neon. Um, and it was, uh, it was also up for about six hours. But the photographs have gone around the world, and uh, we were trying to help out. If you, some of you may not be old enough to remember the Joe Camel campaign. It was a, you know, uh, Camel cigarettes were selling cigarettes with a ca cartoon character, right? And the only thing they didn't do, which I think that was in the works, but for some reason it didn't work out, they might have done it in Southeast Asia or somewhere, maybe China, but they should have had a children's show with Joe Camel, uh, like a Saturday morning children's show, but they didn't. So this is a billboard that we altered uh, and improved. We, we like to say we're improving the billboards. On with the campaign. So um, this is another campaign, the uh, Apple thing. So, so now Apple, now at the time that we did this, Apple was everybody's hero around here. Everybody loved Apple. Apple was a great company. You know, our products, products are really good, right? And uh, so we thought, okay, that's all good and fine, but they're using dead people in a lot of their campaigns to advertise something that these dead people might not have gone along with. You know, they had Alfred Hitchcock and you know, a couple of others. They, they also used the Dalai Lama, and we changed his billboard to Think Disillusioned. He was alive at the time, so I imagine he got the residuals for the billboard. <laughs> but um, um, so going along, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> Ronald McDonald. Ronald McDonald was having a 50th birthday back in 2000 and whatever it was. I can't remember, 2007 or something like that. And my, my old friend Ron English, who's a painter from New York and a billboard artist, uh, a billboard hacker from way back, good friend. We decided we need to do something for Ronald McDonald's 50th birthday. So he, he was coming out here. We got together with a bunch of friends and, uh, and created this scheme. And Ron and I had both watched this television show when we were a kid, a Twilight Zone episode called uh, um, uh, to, to Serve Man. Did anybody know that? <laughs> to Serve Man? To Serve Man is uh, it's, it's a story about these, it's this alien race that comes to the planet, and they're super chill. They're really awesome. They like humans. They're clearly way advanced from us, and they're helping us out with all kinds of things, right? And, uh, you know, so people really dug them. It's okay, the aliens are here. You know, they're, they're helping us. That's really cool. And so what they would do is they would occasionally bring very special, like, uh, really high-level, like, VIPs to their planet, Right, and they you know take a like a like a like a spaceship trip there, and one of the uh, one of the scientist women was like kind of suspect of them. And the, the aliens all carried this one book around with them, and uh, the book uh, she swiped one of the books from them and translated it, and uh, it was a cookbook, and they were bringing humans to their planet to eat them, 
So we decided to do this billboard campaign where Ron <laughs> created, created a, a little fat boy, Ronald, you know, Ronald McDonald, and, uh, and, uh, and, an, and an alien dude. And me and my crew, uh, Don Paul Swain and, uh, and uh, Louise Jarmilowitz and uh, some other folks built a seven foot tall, evil Ronald McDonald. It was animatronic and he was pushing a hamburger into a fat kid's face. And uh, so we put this billboard up in the, in the parking lot of the Cala Foods at the end of Hate Heart- Street, right across the street from the uh, biggest volume McDonald's store in the Bay Area. And we brought along a bunch of Ronalds with us. And, and a bunch of Hamburglers, of course. And then when we were done with the billboard, see, we had all these, like, Ronalds down on the ground. So while we were doing the billboard, you know, they drew attention away from us. Uh, and then we jumped down, and Ron and I and our two helpers, you know, got up in our, our Ronald McDonald's outfits, and then we joined the crowd. There's, there's Ron right there. And uh, went into the McDonald's store, where, of course, it's not a party until the police show up. That's when you know it's a party. <laughs> And we, and we had about 30 Ronald McDonald's, and we wanted to buy a package of, of French fries, right? So everybody's reaching in their pockets. I got three cents. I got five cents. I got, and we couldn't have, we didn't, between all 30 of us, we didn't have enough money to buy one package of French fries. <laughs> so the cops gave us the heave-ho, and then more cops came. And since they couldn't figure out what was really going on or who to blame, <laughs> they arrested Ronald. <laughs> And the poor fat kid. And they put him in the paddy wagon. And away they went. There they go. So, uh, I don't know, how much time do I have left here? I got a bunch of other stuff. Five minutes, okay, okay. So, so um, there's other stuff. I mean, we, we, were, we were a media pranks group. I mean, the, my whole idea, I started looking at this as theater, right? I started looking at the whole thing as theater. Because it's, you know, it's like, we honestly didn't do that many billboards. I mean, Ron English, God bless him, he'd do, he'd do like 10 billboards in a week. The guy was a billboard cyclone, right? The BLF, we'd, we'd do like one billboard a year maybe, but we would tell the press that we did like 30 of them, and they'd print it. So it's kind of like, you know, and in, in, in our 34-year history, which ended in 2011, that's when we officially retired, and we, you know, gave up the ghost. Um, I mean, we, you know, we'd been anonymous for 34 years, and nobody gave a shit, and there's Banksy, right? And like, so we, were, we figured we were done. And, uh, and uh, so, but, but, so it was a media pranks group, and the idea was that, uh, you know, you would get the media to say things that you wanted them to say to make fun of the process of the media and, and to help people understand that you can't fucking believe anything. And if you think you can believe anything now, talk to Joey Skaggs, okay, who's one of my heroes. You can't believe shit that you read anywhere. And, and now they can create, you know, images and moving images that can replicate anything whatsoever, and they can't be, it can't be determined that they're not, they're not uh, the truth they so th- we're in a post-truth age here, which you're gonna have, we're all going to have to deal with in some fashion. But I looked at this as... Which really don't mean very much in the <laughs> overall scheme of things. And, uh, yeah, they're stupid and it's fun. Yeah. The, it's like he's trying to figure out why we do... Some of it. Um, if, if, oh, I can't? Okay. Um, we're gonna turn the, then we'll let's just turn the volume up. Uh, can you fast forward over there by chance? No. Okay, well, I don't know. It's kind of a... Anyway, so it was a billboard where we, we kidnapped a journalist from New York and tortured him for, uh, you know, I don't know, for about two days. Uh, Yeah, and also calling yourself a prankster is really a dumb thing to do if you're around other pranksters. But, yeah. Oh, wait, you know what, there's a... uh, Which really don't mean... Oh, well. Okay. Well, I'll just tell... tell Which really don't mean very much (laughs) in the overall scheme of things. And, uh, you know, they're stupid um, and it's fun. The, it's like he's trying to figure out why we do this stuff, and the, the best thing to do is like not say anything definitely, of course. So I'm trying to impart the reasons I do this stuff. Like the billboards are making a message is one thing, but the uh, it's like the action and adventure, of, like sneaking around, you know, like here in the military, you know, like point A point B, and also creating an atmosphere of uh, real mystery um, about what's going on. Because he's going to be going to different places. He doesn't know who's who and what's what. He suspects that if it works right, he'll suspect that people that are doing weird shit might be part of some plot, but he won't be able to prove it. And so we'll put him in his weird altered lines. He doesn't know where the fuck he is. He's just running around all day. He just got almost got assaulted by a queen. Okay, so he's going to be flipped out. <laughs> if things are working right, he's like, he's going to be on it. You're going to be hiding out. At this point, you're just hiding out. You're just hiding out. But he can see you from a distance. It's okay. If he's 200 feet away, it's okay if he sees you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're just there. He, know who, he has no idea who's who. Clothing store, where you find a clutch purse, which is that. Which is that?
We leave the uh, Shutterstock and Garage, okay? Mm-hmm. Then, Next um, place we go is here. You wanna, what you want to do is you want to bring Scott here and drop him off. And you, and you take off, okay? So you guys following this, Scott? You come here. You're with Billy. You work here. You're his accountant. I don't want this guy to know that everybody in this junkyard is in on this, okay? I want, I want to do as much. I know that's a tall order, but I want to do as much as I humanly can to keep him from knowing that you're all in on this. By the way, it's Oakdale, not Evans, which Scott thought. paranoid as humanly possible. Like, who's in on it, who's not in on it. And, and I knew a lot of people in San Francisco. I knew people that Poor guy, if I was him by now, I'd be really and so it was literally a setup to make him write what we wanted. Yo, baby, where are you? And, and he knew that we knew that... He just got the envelope? He got the envelope? Just got the envelope? You're shitting. You know what I mean? But it was a good story. Just got it. So we figured... Now, the boards that I was looking at today when I was going so around, then, when did you do those? So then, what came out of this was, uh, he, wrote, he wrote the major compendium on advertising in the late 20th century, and, uh, which is called Advertising Today, and in it he did 13 interviews, uh, one, of them, and, oh, one of them was with Jeff Goodby, Goodby Silverstein, I don't know if you know advertising companies, but he's kind of a, he's been around for a while, and uh, he did one with uh, Benetton, the guy from Benetton, and uh, Jerry Seinfeld. And then he put us in there as an advertising agency. The Billboard Liberation Front is an advertising agency. And our budget for the entire thing was about $300. <laughs> so I got a kick out of that particular prank. So that's what you can do if you have a lot of friends and a lot of spare time. So thank you very much. And and thank you to Odd Salon. This is an amazing and wonderful event that they put on. And keep patronizing it and bring all your friends. So, it's been five years and three talks, John. Right. <laughs> Which means... Oh my God. Woohoo! I'm in! Fuck Will yeah. you join us? I have a pin for you. Yay! Thank you very much. This is very cool. I thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you so much. One more round for John. Well, that brings us to the end of Prank. I know. <laughs> I could go in at great length and how amazing tonight was and how our speakers were, which I will in a moment. But before I give up to the commercial part of the night, I want to end with simple finishing the quote we started earlier. Will you all join me again? So, good night unto you all. Give me your hands if we be friends. And Robin shall restore amends. I want to big, give a big heartfelt thank you to all our speakers tonight for my first curation. 
Thank you for making me look so good. Amy, Leonard, Daniel, Aaron, John, and Vale. I am Ryan Galliato. I have been your curator, and I would not be here without the wonderful audience. But coming up next, please join us in two weeks for stories of the eccentric. You have to realize with this crowd, eccentric is a very high bar. So that's July 10th at this very location. Oh, and you can get advanced tickets right here. Stage right. Your left. And if you're inspired to talk, join the talks, we would love to have you. This stage is for all of us. Please submit your brilliant ideas to oddsalon.com slash speak. And join us on the mailing lists, on all the media. Okay, one more time. Wait. On the media. media. There we go. <laughs> and if you like what you say here, please consider please consider joining the membership of Odd Salon as part of our Patreon community or as a, uh, you could even sponsor a whole talk, a salon yourself. Our members and Patreons both enjoy a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to Odd Stories from Odd Salon speakers and fellows. We do? Okay. <laughs> so please go online for more information or inquire with our lovely people that are volunteering their time to sell you fabulous Odd Salon products. And finally, join the conversation at Odd Salon, where we'll be posting follow-up stories, where people got their research, um, and some of your very own questions. So thank you again to Public Works. Our amazing speakers tonight, the people that volunteered and gave their time, and we'll see you next time. Or wait, wait. Before we go, I'd like to issue one final thank you to our fabulous Ryan Galliotto, who uh, curated magnificently tonight. Uh, please give him an additional round of applause. It's very hard work. So as a thank you, we have, in a sense of a wonderful recursion, our speaker gift to you, our, our curator gift to you is Pranks by V Vale. Please, uh, please visit the table. And from me to you, your very own Groucho Harvey. Thank you so much for all the hard work you put into this. You were fabulous. Thank you. And if all the Odd Salon fellows could, could hang back a minute, that would be fabulous. Uh, we will be open for a few more minutes. Please chat, ask us questions, visit our merch table, uh, ask fellows about membership and Patreon. Thank you so much for coming out. And like, speak with some of the other members, uh, other people in the audience. We're all here sharing great stories.